Um, good. So uh, I'm from App Annie. I'm kind of presuming most people have an idea. Um, who uses App Annie? Hands in the air. Yeah, pretty much everyone. That's, that's good. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that. What I'm going to try and do, though, is tell a bit of a story and, and give you some facts and figures really around why Asia is so important and a bit more granular detail to support that as well. Um, I'm, you know, I think from an App Annie point of view, we're, we're really uh, fortunate in that we see figures and perspectives and insight that others don't have access to. So I'm going to try and um, share that with you and hopefully you can take some of the uh, some useful things away from it to your, and apply it to your own context. Um, okay, so I think most people know what we do, so I'm not really going to dwell too much on that. Um, I, I, I'll get told off if I don't put a slide up there telling you that we have lots of premium products as well as the free products that you may use. Um, I'm sure there's uh, plenty of premium users as well. Uh, I think this is kind of important, though. Um, I don't know if you know the history of App Annie. We actually started in Beijing. Everyone thinks we're a US company because of all the Silicon Valley VC money behind us and all that. But we actually started in, in Beijing. We were started by a Frenchman who was hanging out in Beijing and saw the, the problems of getting insight out of the app stores as that was coming around sort of eight years ago. So our, our history is very much tied to there. Um, all our data science teams run out of there, and, and it's our, actually our biggest region as a company. So, so we do have a lot of people who are very insightful about it, and we spend a lot of time actually helping our customers connect with our teams in those regions. So um, afterwards, if you do want any intros to the App Annie team who are based out there, just let me know. I'd be really happy to, happy to help with that. Um, and I guess just final slide so you get a sense of scale. Uh, those of you who put your hands up about being an App Annie user, you're one of over a million now, which we were really pleased about as a landmark for us. Um, and you, you kind of know what we do. You get a sense we're fortunate to work with some uh, 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 it's amazing companies, really. OK, so let's start. I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of top level. We'll talk about some, some app economy numbers, and then we'll dive in a little bit more. We'll put an Asian slant on it uh, and try and pull out some of the things that are maybe more relevant. So top line numbers, 178 billion app downloads last year. I don't know if that's a, a number you're aware of, um, but that's a 60% growth since 2015. So in terms of acceleration, it just continues to grow from that downloads part, so the, the sort of top of the, the, the top of the chain, if you like. Um, and then if we look at, at usage, um, these numbers increase continually as well. So it's not just m more users, more downloads, it's more usage of that as well. And we're at a point where it's about 40 apps on average. It does vary slightly by region. Um, and that's out of those, out of 80 apps installed. There's some you know, amazing stats around the number of apps that are, that are still around now compared to the ones that have, have died. But it's on average, you know, people use less than half the apps that are actually installed on their device on a monthly basis. You know, and the challenge for, all, for everyone, of course, is being in that half that's used and what you have to do to, to secure that. Um, and then if we look at, uh, at the actual kind of time, what that adds up to, it's on average over the globe, it's three hours a day. UK is a bit less. UK is more like two, closer to two than three hours a day. But if you think about that, that's like a month a year, at two hours a day spent actually in apps. And that's, it's a crazy number. But, and it continues to increase. And you see the 30% growth. I mean, where it's going to top out at, I, I don't know. Um, but if you think, actually, what it means is if you're whilst it's a, lot, a large amount of time, if you're an app developer, a lot of what you're doing is competing for people's attention out of that, because there does reach a, a maximum amount of time that people are going to spend in app. And you know, there's been some examples of games that have, have, have been incremental. I guess Pokemon Go is probably the best example in recent years, where it, it used time that people weren't normally spending in app. But most of the time, you, you, it's displacement. You know, you're competing for people's time. I like the guy from Netflix, um, CEO of Netflix, who has asked what's his, uh, what's his biggest competitor, to which his answer was sleep. Um, you know, and, and you see that. It's about uh, attention. So this, this will reach a, reach a maximum at some point. OK, so let's sort of round the, the top line part out by talking about, um, talking about revenue. And actually, this number is, is out of the, the main, out of um, iOS plus Google Play stores in 2017. So it's $86 billion. And you see that's doubled since 2015. So in terms of the, the, the monetization that backs up this usage, that's growing e even faster. 
And this part, I hope you can, I don't know if the colors are a bit weird on that, but I hope you can, you can get, a, get the picture here. This is where I'm starting to talk a bit more about APAC, because that 86 billion, whilst it's a big number, when you break it down regionally, two thirds of that is coming from APAC, which is, is, is just, you know, obviously stands out. But more than that, if you look at these growth rates here, the growth rate, the, the year on year growth rate, it's actually growth versus 2015, but it's double. The, the growth rate is more than double America's and more than double Europe. And it's already at two thirds of the global spend in, in terms of revenues. This is just talking app store spends. So, you know, if you, if you want a reason about why you can't, or, or a, a, you know, a, an analysis of why you can't ignore APAC, then uh, there's nothing clearer than that, I think. So if we look at where it's headed, we, we, can, we see that continuing to grow. Um, if you look out to 2022, we see the 86 billion um, increasing up to 157. So again, you, know, you get a sense of what the, the growth rate is on that now. And if you break that down to annual spend per consumer, it comes out at something by 2022 at uh, being $26 um, per device. So you know, it seems like a, a reasonable number, but the, the, Again, the, the disparity, the difference within regions is incredible on that. The, the top country um, is Japan. We expect that to stay being Japan. But by 2022, our projections are an average spend of $140 in Japan per device. So, you know, it, it, again, pretty, pretty sizable numbers. So the good news for everyone here, I think, is uh, if you look at gaming's share of that, so if we take those numbers, we're looking at the 87, the 157. Uh, currently, you know, over all of, those, in fact, all of that analysis we've done, whilst gaming only accounts for around a third, just over a third of all the downloads that are there, it's the vast majority of the spend. So people are spending 80% you know, of that money that we're talking about of the App Store purchase is going to game, um, game developers, game publishers. Um, and we don't, again, we don't particularly see that changing. All right. Quiz time, it's Monday afternoon, it's a long day, people traveled, getting a little bit late. So let's spice it up a little bit with a quick quiz. Games, so how many games do you think in 2017 exceeded $1 billion? Mobile games exceeded $1 billion in revenue. And I need to, I need to just add one sort of caveat on this. We can't currently see revenues out of the third party Android stores in China. So this is Apple and Google Play. So you take Apple and Google Play revenues in 2017, roll it up, how many games beat the billion dollar mark? Anybody think it's two? Two, a few twos, any threes? Okay, fours? It's three of you, and fives? A few, okay, so the three of you who said four, give, give yourselves a round of applause, well done. Yay! I don't have any prizes, I'm afraid. That's terrible. If you give me your cards after, we've got these really funky, um, very good chargers, which have little games on them as well. So if you give me a card, I'll send you one of those. Um, the games. So the interesting thing is the games are all APAC games. Yeah, and that's kind of the story that comes out of it. Top, um, top is Honor of Kings, um, which I think is the next slide. There you go. Top is Honor of Kings, which... Um, in 2017 was about 1.7 billion of revenue. Um, and actually, if you look at that, that's the second highest annual revenue we've ever seen for a mobile game. Um, uh, Clash of Clans was slightly higher in 2014, I think it was 1.8. Um, but the, all the games are Asian. I mean, you see, you know, Honor of Kings uh, has done incredibly well promoted across the Tencent network. Um, but Fate Grand Order, Monster Strike, and Lineage M were the other uh, the other top ones, but it's, it's just, you know, it just demonstrates how weighted this market is towards Asia when you see all of those, um, you know, all, all of the games coming out of there. Um, and that, I think, is a, there you go, that answers your question even better than I could. There's your top list. Um, but it, I think lineage is interesting. I think they're the only one where you have two, effectively two from the same, uh, same franchise. And it gives you an, an idea. It isn't just China. There's a, you know, more of a balance to it. There is a, a focus on, uh, towards Korea as well. The, the APAC story is slightly broader than, uh, than just what we see in China. But I think you, know, you can get kind of caught up with, with the big hits and say, you know, maybe you know, the question is, is there only really space for these mega games? 
Um, and the good news, I think, hopefully for some of the people in the room, is the answer to that question is no. Um, the, the benefits that this revenue spread is, is, is broad. Um, so we looked at the number of games that generated more than five million in, uh, in annual consumer spend. And back in 2015, there was 600, but that's increased more than 50%. You know, we're getting on to close to 1,000 games. It'll be well over 1,000 games in 2018 that actually generate more than 5 million in, in that annual consumer spend. So I think you know, it, it's good news that the benefits are, are there and are a, a much wider spread. Okay, so um, are these maps working there? They seem to, Africa seems to have disappeared. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Africa. <laughs> I, I really don't know how that's happened. It's absolutely fine on my screen, but there. Um, I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you get a sense of the, of the growth. It's kind of a heat map, so you see the, the top areas of the over 50% growth here. Um, China and, and Korea standing out. You know, no surprise, we just talked about that with Honor of Kings and Lineage. Uh, and then, but you see where the, the skew is and the sort of slightly lighter colors for, for Europe and, uh, and North America, LATAM being kind of somewhere in the middle ground. Um, but China's worth, worth a focus on, just a, a, a bit more detail on, because I mean, it, it is crazy. There's a billion devices, a billion mobile devices in China. And we were talking about usage, I'll give you some kind of usage figures before, but it's 200 billion hours spent in mobile devices, in apps now, within China. Um, you know, and when you, when you add it up, it's, um, I think it's like one in four of every dollars that monetizes. Um, I think that, that's broad. So if you take, take the, the in-app spend and you add um, advertising and you add m-commerce as well, the kind of you know, Amazon you know, purchases, whatever, Alibaba, you roll that all together, one dollar in every four that's spent through mobile devices comes out of China now. So it is, um, it, it's a market that just stands out on its own and the, and the willingness to, to, to spend continues to increase there. Okay, I just wanted to share this with you. Um, I don't know, some of you may have seen this before. It's a model we worked out at App Annie a while ago, but we see it replayed um, in, in pretty much every market. There tends to be these three phases that markets go through. There's an initial um, drive on downloads, which is the, the gray line at the top. You see as, as mobile, um, as mobile really starts to take hold in a market, that the download of apps goes through the roof, and that's exactly where India is now. You know, there's more apps downloaded um, on, on certainly on, on Google, Google Play, Android in, in India now than there is in the US or, or anywhere. It's absolutely exploded um, for downloads. And then over time, as things start to mature, um, then you see the usage start to increase. So there's this sort of frantic download and, and churn at the start. Then it starts to move into usage, and, th and that expands. And then it starts to, to, to move to monetization. So you see these more mature markets towards the right-hand side. Once they've gone through um, a, a plateau of downloads, you go through a plateau of usage, and then you start to really see the revenue increase. And the important thing, I mean, you know, Japan and, and South Korea, right at the top in terms of market maturity, now, you know, way ahead of, uh, of UK and US, certainly. But I think just one point about China that's worth, worth, um, worth considering or worth recognizing is it's, it's two really different markets. If you split out the, um, the tier one cities, sort of, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, and, the, and, and bundle in the tier two cities like Chengdu, um, then it, it's really different. It's a, that in itself is a more mature market than, say, the US. Whereas when you drop down a level and you start to look at the, bundle together the tier three cities with, with rural, um, then it, it looks quite different and it's much more on that early stage of growth. So I think just a point, and, you know, as you think about China, don't just think of it as a homogenous market. You have to recognize these, these two different bits to it. And, and one or other or both of them may be relevant for you, but if both are relevant, the strategies are going to be quite, um, are going to, you know, need to be quite different to, to optimize on that. Okay, so th there's kind of a, a couple of bits left in what I wanted to talk about. I'm going to do just a, um, a, a fairly quick talk around the around the spend around the, um, the the trends. Sorry, that are happening, and I think that you know the point is the trends move quite quickly um, in these markets. 
And then in closing, I'm just going to just give you a couple examples of, of, of partnerships uh, and some of the, the, the stories we've seen at App Annie from, from successful partnerships, particularly in, in Asia markets. So, you know, three trends. I guess, you know, Battle Royale is a fairly obvious one and player unknown battlegrounds. Partnering with Tencent was, was big news. But if you saw the, the growth in, in rules of survival, um, I mean, uh, NetEase obviously had knives out already, uh, but we're looking at here just a, a, the growth rate from, from November back out of um, NetEase if you roll together rules of survival and, and knives out. And the ability to go for, to react in that market and almost get ahead of what was happening with that trend with, with Battle Royale coming into, um, coming into Asia it just shows how, you know, it's a good example of, of, of how quickly the reaction was on their, um, and of, of uh, particularly rules of survival. And uh, secondly is, is eSports. Really, we're really seeing this taking off now heavily in, um, in Asia. It's difficult to forecast. Um, we, we haven't quite got enough data to really get a good sense of it. But you know, if you want an indicator, Tencent have come out and said they want you know, mobile eSports to be a $15 billion business in China by 2020. So as a kind of statement of intent and where it's headed, that's um, it, it's pretty pretty clear, and we're seeing that already. Seeing sort of summoners war rules of survival, some of the the, the, the money pots going into into esports with that is uh, a pretty significant already. You know, and, and I think maybe the question is, it's games like this that, that we see taking the lead at the moment. But where's esports going? And if you think about the, the speed at which the trends evolve, you know, if you've got a game, if you're in, in you know, real-time strategy, say, you're going to be thinking about, well, you know, what's the, the esports implication for that? Is it just going to be these games? Or what's going to be next within esports is definitely, uh, uh, definitely a consideration. And then finally, in terms of, of trends, is uh, you know, I've got to pull out HQ. You, you guys play HQ? No, it completely stops our office these days at three o'clock every afternoon. Um, it came, it obviously, it started in the US, had a, a, a crazy growth in, um, in 2017. And you can see the, uh, the, the growth from, yeah, from, from pretty much late last, late last year. Um, and the, the, just that growth in weekly, um, weekly active users. But it's, um, you know, you call it appointment gaming or whatever it is, those scheduled interactions. But it was really um, interesting to see how quickly the Chinese market reacted to this. So HQ, lots of publicity um, in the US towards the back end of the year. And then a number of apps came out emulating it in Q1 and actually emulating it at scale. So the daily prizes, uh, one of them was uh, uh, in, in Q1. There were some huge pots coming out. It's $150,000, I think, just on one, one of the apps on a daily prize. And if you roll together a few of the, uh, a few of the, exam a few of the, the apps that were replicating, uh, if that's the right word, HQ within China, the total pot was over 600,000 on, on one day. That, that, that was up for grabs out of that. So it's just, I'm just trying to sort of give you an indication of how quick we see the, the trends moving and, and the opportunities that creates to actually you know, execute on that. So that was trends. And then uh, just a couple of examples, really, to, to, to round out. Um, first of all is, is, an, is an old one, but this was maybe the first one that, that really got used as a, as, a, as a case study or a classic example of the need to partner. And I think everyone you know, accepts that there's the need to partner now in, in markets like uh, China and Japan for, for Western publishers, certainly. Um, this is a, a Candy Crush. And if you look back before Candy Crush partnered with Tencent, the, the, when you can see the rankings there, they were dropping 100 down to 150th in terms of rankings, um, download rank, that is, in, in China. And the, the revenue, the, the Chinese market for King was accounting for 0.1% of their revenues, which is just crazy when you think about the, the, the size of the market. So there was a, a big rethink, the partnership with Tencent, the, the promotion that came uh, with WeChat off the back of that. And you can see the red line is then the WeChat integrated version of, uh, of Candy Crush that came out a few months later. And it took, I mean, it completely changed the game. It took it right to the, to the top of the rankings. It moved King from a publisher who were you know, outside the top 50 in China up into top 10. 
And in terms of revenues, King, King were nowhere. They were way outside the top 100. Um, you know, post this, uh, this partnership, they were up into the 30s, I think, something like that. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, a well-recognized example, but it was one of the, the first that's worth uh, just restating. And just a final one, which I like, is um, Gameloft um, with Disney Magic Kingdom. So Gameloft had kind of struggled with, with the Japanese market. And when Disney Magic Kingdom launched, they actually took a, a slightly different approach and held back on that. Obviously, you want to go into Japan. It's the biggest market in terms of of individual monetization. But I held back, looked for the right partner, really worked carefully on it, and I think it was an eight-month delay before the, um, before the Japanese version came out. But you can see here, actually, that the blue line is, is, um, is, is global, uh, global revenues on the, on the non-Japanese version, if you like. Um, and you can see, after it launched in, in, I think it was November time, November, December time, the Japanese app on its own actually was doing more revenue than, than the rest of the world, than, than the whole world on, the, on the, the non-partnered version, if you like. And over time, it's obviously settled down a bit, but it's still accounting for pretty much a quarter of all global revenues of Disney Magic Kingdom comes from that, that partnership, the partnership being done with Gung Ho. Um, to actually get the content right and the user experience and the distribution and promotion, of course. So a couple of examples of, of uh, what we've seen as successful partnerships. Uh, just, just wrapping up, really, what we've talked about. Um, yeah, I think giving you lots of stats, happy to make those available. If that's useful for you in, in discussions in your own organizations, just see me afterwards, drop me a card or something, I'm happy to send those on to you, um, you know, it, it really speaks for itself. It's not just the size, but it's the rate of growth and the differentials in rate of growth as well. And then I think if you're looking into China market, I mean, it says China, but actually kind of any market, I would say this is, is true. It's those really, those three things are important. Really understand the market, understand the, the spend, understand what the, 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 the breakdown of that spend is by the top games, by what the long tail looks like. Um, the trends, I think, I mean, we, we covered that you know, fairly quickly, but the, the point is the trends move very quickly in these markets, and it can create opportunities, I think, for, for, for game publishers and developers to move really quickly on those, move very quickly on those. And, and partners, um, you know, we work with a lot of our big games, game companies globally, on, and, uh, and all of them partner, and, and different levels of partnership, different uh, degrees of success. I've shared a couple of, of examples of you there, but it's it's really that partnership strategy is so important now in uh, in in getting it right and being successful in that market. And I think I'm not even sure how I'm doing for time, Chris, but I think there's probably. Am I? Good. Okay. The first round of applause. So it's you know I think one thing that's interesting is. Um, Things do move really quickly in Asia, and I think you know Rules of Survival is an amazing example of that. Here you have on PC and, and console the rise of uh, PUBG and Battle Royale games, and before they can get their game to market, a Korean outfit does it for them. Yeah. Um, what can studios do to protect themselves? I mean, other than moving faster, but I mean, what, what can they really do to protect themselves from the, the opportunity cost of not being first to market in Asia? Yeah. I think it's, it's really hard to take a, def a defensive strategy. I've not seen anyone try and, and legislate and control and manage it as, as you might do in a Western market by defensively trying to control it. And some things, just things aren't really clear. Even publishers not being able to control which stores their games are on. Sometimes you see that quite often where it just a, a appears you're not quite sure entirely why. So I, I think the only the only form of defense is being aggressive with it and, and getting out there quickly and, and just trying to think faster and act faster than the people who are going to be competition and accept some kind of, of uh, um, uh, just some reality that it is going to happen. Obviously, the, the, the key thing is that longer term success and that quality, and you're always going to lose a bit of, of, of download, um, you know, download share to those games that come out quickly, but longer term usual rules apply about the you know, the retention and the longevity and the engagement of the game and driving the, ultimately the revenue success, which is, is kind of what we're all focused on eventually. You're not getting too hung up about those immediate copies and download loss, I think. I like the fact that Chris is still running at the uh, end, end of the day. It's good work now. Hi. Um, you talked about uh, the kind of market uh, maturity mm. and the, the three phases uh, from, from what's happened in China. 
and India being in the kind of right now the mass installs frenzy phase. What's the kind of speed you might expect India to, to move to the next two phases? What's the what, sorry? The How long do you think it's going to take for India to sort of move through okay. to, you know, the mature yeah. market phases? Yeah, I, I think India is going very quickly. I think, you know, the probably the year of download growth for, for India, that real explosion was 2016. And we saw that carrying on through 2017, but we're starting to see it move into that usage stage already. I think if you look at the, maybe a good indicator is the competition that Walmart and Amazon going head to head to try and get Flipkart, um, the Flipkart acquisition, which is, you know, when you start to see that kind of big e-com play, which is really all about usage, it's that regular usage of apps rather than people experimenting they're happy to start to take those daily activities supermarket purchases that kind of thing into apps so i think we're probably kind of there already with india we haven't seen the, the um haven't seen the the revenue takeoff in, in india yet whether that's going to be I mean, we're not seeing it now it's whether it's going to come 2019 i guess probably if you asked internally at, at app annie for opinions you'd probably say 2019 is when we see or when we expect to see the real revenue explosion in in india in the same way it happened in in 2017 in china i mean you know the amazing thing about seeing that spend per spend per user spend you know the 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 the, the Ar arpu numbers all just go through the roof in 2017 in china i think that's probably probably next year is there a different cultural response towards pay to win mechanics between asia that allows some of these more competitive games games to generate larger revenues than they do in north america or can you speak to sort of how those mechanics in game inter interact with different cultures i think there's there's more willingness to spend is, is, the, is probably the top line. In terms of how it impacts on game mechanics, I think that the thing that, that I see, um, and uh, you know, I, there's, there's people in App Annie who are a lot closer to it than me, but the thing I see is that is the refresh rate changes so much in, 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 the, game, in the way the games operate. So you know, there is a willingness to spend, there's a willingness to spend and progress and go next level and, and new things and new areas and so on. And we see, in the, the really successful games, particularly in Japan and, and South Korea, where there's just that new content all the time and new options available. And almost if you, if you don't do that, you can't keep up with the willingness to progress uh, of, of gamers who will, who will really invest and commit to a game. And you see there's, there's many stories of, of, of Western games that have transferred to, to Japan or South Korea and just haven't worked not through anything other than they don't move fast enough. There's not enough new things to do quickly if somebody's spending 90 minutes a day, you know, 60 minutes plus a day playing the game. So I think you know, that's maybe more content than core mechanics, but it's definitely a, a factor you need, to, you need to get right when you're engaging with those kinds of players. Anybody else? All right, well, I think that's it. A uh, big round of applause for Paul Barnes, please. Thank you so yeah. much.